exactly what we gather to do today is worship your holy name because you've proven yourself worthy of all our worship, Lord. You're the same today, tomorrow, and forever. And so, Lord, we come into this place. We'd ask you to fill this place with your Holy Spirit and we can feel you moving among us, Lord. And we truly know we've been in your presence this morning. Bless each and every one that's gathered here this morning. And those that couldn't make it here this morning because of whatever, Lord, just be with them. Give them a special blessing this morning. Let them know that you love them, Lord, and that we are missing them and thinking of them. Lord, just we just thank you so much for all the opportunities you've given us, Lord, and the blessings you bestow upon us, Lord. You are the Lord of the Lord, the God of gods, and Lord, we just ask that you would bless this church and keep us and under your guidance and direction, Lord, in everything we do. Bless this time together now in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Maybe see you. I invite you to look at the prayer concerns that are listed in your bulletin. I want to mention uh, for you to pray for Dana McCoy. Uh, Dana has been on our prayer list for a while for cancer, and uh, now she had her gallbladder out and she's getting ready to go to uh, Montana. And so we need to pray for her. Um, also, we got word that Sheila's aunt, or Uncle Bill Sickles, passed away just this morning. And so we need to pray for Bill, uh, Bill's family, Jenny, Sweetie, and her sister Mary as well. And brother Lonnie. And one, so pray for that family. Um, we continue to pray for the cloaks who lost their house last Sunday in a fire. Um, they got smoke damage. It's still standing, but a lot of damage there. Um, any other names that we can add to the list? Loretta Hall has kidney failure. So traveling emergencies for Lisa Ferreira. Is it um, grandma and grandpa camp? Is that what you guys are having this week? Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> I, I don't do that anymore. I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't have that kind of time to do that. Becky Verna, welcome back. You moved back to Iowa? Yes. Wow. Oh, so welcome back. Everybody welcome Thank them you. back. <laughs> He doesn't know that you're supposed to sit in the front of the church. So, no, that's... Any other prayer concerns? All right. Again, keep praying for our nation and, and just everything going on there. Um, but let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come to you today. Uh, Lord, we take, we just ask that you take everything that's on our minds today that are just uh, flooding our minds and, and delving into our heart. Lord, we just humbly give that to you today. Lord, we want to focus clearly on you and what you're doing in this world. And so, Lord, I just pray that you take away any distraction, any heartache, uh, any pain that we have, just take it away so we may focus on you this morning and all of next week. Lord, we have names on this list. Uh, you know they're very mean. Lord, uh, we have people like Dana who has just been in a battle for her life. And Lord, we just pray for her that you provide the total healing over her body. Uh, Lord, we pray for Loretta and her kidney failure. Lord, just remove that from her and Lord, just be with her and provide healing for her and for Lisa, we pray traveling mercies, just clear the road away for her and let her and Justin uh, be safe. 
And Lord, for all the other names on this list, uh, we just humbly give the names to you. You know their very need. And so we just pray for that. Lord, for this church, we pray for continued guidance in everything that is going on. And Lord, we just pray that you, uh, Lord, just speak to us and put a need on our heart. And the Lord, give us the courage to fulfill that need. And Lord, in the end, let this church be a beacon for the surrounding communities. Lord, just move in a mighty way through each one of us here today. So Lord, we give you all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. At this time, uh, we're not passing the baskets. Um, instead, we just ask if you have a tithe or a gift just to put it in the box in the back. And uh, you can just put, you can get up at any time here and, and put your tithe back there. Uh, at this time, we're going to release the children uh, to go to Children's Church. Michelle Albert's going to take preschool through third, while LaVon is going to have fourth through sixth. So if you want to walk back to the back. Yeah, we'll, we'll pray for the children and you two leaders as well before you head out. Okay, I'll, I'll pray for you guys. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray for the children. Lord, we know that you love them, that you care for them. You know how many hairs are on their head. And so, Lord, we just pray for continued safety. And Lord, let them have lots of fun and uh, be with their teachers as well. And Lord, just guide them in everything they do and say today. In Jesus' name, amen. While they are going to class, I want to invite you to turn with me to 2 Samuel. We've cruised through 1 Samuel already, and now we're in 2 Samuel. I'm going to be reading from chapter 7 and verses 8 through 17. My Bible titles this God's Covenant with David. So this is what was written. Now, therefore, thus you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people in Israel and will plant them, and they may live in their own place and will not be disturbed again. Nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Even from the day that I commanded the judges to be over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. And the Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the son of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. That's God's word for us today. Okay, will you join me as we ask a blessing on Pastor Mark this morning? You know, Lord, Heavenly Father, we just lift up Pastor Mark before you. Just to protect him, watch over him, and everything he does, Lord, and uh, with all the things going on in the world today. We just ask for his hedge of protection around him and his family. But right now, just fill him to overflowing with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Just make the message that comes from him be from you, Lord, and make it something that, that uh, we can carry with us always, Lord. Just bless him now as he brings your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I hope you all had a, a good week with enjoying the rain and the nice weather anyway. Um, 
Yeah, just on Tuesday when we walked in to the sanctuary, uh, you you hear about church mice. Have you ever heard about church mice? Well, one died, and so we had a funeral for it. Uh, no, it really stunk up the church, and so Josh went underneath the stage area and found a dead mouse, a dead rat, and a dead bird, right? Um, oh, two dead mice, and uh, we were about ready to throw up every time we come in here or to get a little faint, and so thanks to Josh who come in and, and got rid of those um, and so it smells a lot better in here. We, we had a lot of diffusers and things going in here to help the, the smell. And so hopefully it smells, smells better today. So we're continuing on in this sermon series, The Essential 100 Stories of the Bible. And we're on number 35. And so that's... Uh, a, big accomplishment to anyone who's been reading. We're out of 1 Samuel. We're in the 2 Samuel. And uh, from last week to this week, what happened that we didn't really read about was that Saul died. And so Saul was being conquered and he ended up falling on his own sword rather than being captured. And so he died in the process. And so now we're in the second Samuel. We're still talking about David. And so our key question is, what is the significance of the Davidic covenant? Davidic, another name for David. David's covenant with the Lord. What's the significance of it? Well, the key idea is David's covenant with the Lord established an everlasting kingdom. That's pretty significant, and I'll talk about that more. And so the passage that I just read um, is in 2 Samuel 12 through 14. It talks about um, David establishing, uh, an, uh, or God establishing David's name forever. And so um, you'll see it. That's the key verse. I'm not going to read it again, but that, that's it. You can write that down. Um, and so we're going to be looking at that even more. So I want you to think about the moon. Have you ever, I, I, I just mentioned this as a side note, have you ever noticed coming out of a tunnel, if the moon's full, it'll look huge coming out of the tunnel for whatever reason. And then we get to Elton and it's really small. It, there, there's some sort of effect I found out that, that causes that distortion. Well, anyway, if you take your binoculars, or if you're fortunate enough to have a telescope, you can look and focus in on the moon, and you can see the craters, you can um, see maybe some edges of possible mountains, and you can really hone in and see all that there is to offer on the moon. And it really is amazing, and it's beautiful. And so when we worship, it's as if we're honing in and we're focusing on God. You see, the sole reason that works is you're focusing in on one object. Yes, it's far away, but you're honing in and you're, you're looking at that one object in focus. So often in our busy life, we lose track and lose focus on what matters most in our life. And that's God's role in our life. We get busy in the midst of life and lose focus. And so God doesn't become as clear as sometimes he seems uh, when we are focusing on him. Well, David, his whole life was focused on God. And when you look at Saul's life, and then you look at David's life, they really are a mirror image of one another. Uh, Saul was more concerned about the men around him and what they thought, and what he concerned himself with, whereas David was always inquiring of the Lord. And so I'm in 2 Samuel chapter 5, and we'll, we'll cruise through 
uh, these three uh, chapters and, and look and see what God has to say to us today. So after Saul died, the tribes of Israel came to David and said, Behold, we're, we are your bone and your flesh. Some say that that's a symbol for bone being strength and flesh being weakness. And it goes on to say, you will shepherd my people Israel, and you'll be a ruler over Israel. This idea of a shepherd, is that why maybe God chose David to be a king? Was that he was a shepherd first. He learned how to care for uh, actual animals, and he learned how to defend them, and, and to care for them. And that... Being a shepherd would make him a good leader of God's chosen people, Israel. That's a distinct possibility. And there's so many things about leaders being shepherds. Even pastors are called shepherds. God has a high place for those who care for his animals and how that relates to being a leader as well. And David wrote Psalm 23 all about being a shepherd and how God and Jesus is the good shepherd. And so uh, this runs deep throughout scripture. And so here they anoint David as king. And so David goes and he captures the stronghold of Zion, which later becomes known as the city of David, which we know as Jerusalem. And so he went and he was starting to set up uh, his whole base in Jerusalem. And he built a palace and he, he used all the finest materials and it specifically records using cedar wood. And he brought carpenters in and they built this house for David. And it says that he had established his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. That was God. Uh, and it centered right there in Jerusalem. And here it says in verse 13, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem. And he came from Hebron. And more sons and daughters were born to David. And now in the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. And it goes on and it lists, and it lists Nathan, and it lists Solomon, two important people coming up. And so while he was in Jerusalem, God gave him a palace, and God gave him more and more descendants as well. And so now David's there and he decides he wants to go to battle with the Philistines and the Philistines kept battling. They were like a thorn in David's side. And so David inquires of the Lord. Look at verse 19. This thread runs all the way through David's life. He inquires of the Lord. And he says, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And then the Lord said, I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And so David goes and he's getting ready to, to conquer and go into battle. When David inquires of the Lord again. And here God says, do not go directly up and circle, but circle behind them and come in front of the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then act promptly. For the Lord will have gone out before you uh, to strike the army of the Philistines. And so David went and did as he was told. This battle was so critical, so important. Some scholars say this is David's equivalent to a D-Day or England's version of Dunkirk. This was an important battle. David had just become king. Philistines had been a thorn in their side, and David just went right after them. 
And not to mention, they had the Ark of the Covenant. And so they get the Ark of the Covenant, and in chapter 6, they're moving this Ark. One time I saw on TV, um, and you, you have to be careful about some of the biblical things you see on TV. They're not always 100% accurate. But in this case, they were showing how detailed and crafted this Ark actually was and how incredibly heavy it was and how people would have to carry it and, and they would sometimes have to go through tunnels that they could barely fit the ark through. And it, it was pretty fascinating. So here they were carrying it. So they got smart. And they decided, hey, let's build a cart for it. There's this nifty invention called the wheel. Let's use it. And so they built this cart. And they had it on. And they were going through this treacherous territory. And here comes um, two of the people that were helping was Uzzah and Ohio. And they were there, and all of a sudden, uh, the cart kind of moves, and, and Uzzah reaches out and touches the Ark of the Covenant. Well, now, there were all sorts of things prescribed around the Ark of the Covenant, and you were to treat it with the utmost, utmost respect, and that was a sign of disrespect. And lo and behold, God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there because he touched the ark of the Lord. And David became angry with the Lord because of this. Here was a man, he didn't necessarily mean or want to that I know of, uh, and, and he just touched it, and he, and he died. And so David saw that, and he was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him. So David instead took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom. Can you imagine being Obed-Edom? And they're like, hey, be careful not to touch this because you'll die. We're just going to keep it at your house, right? Like, and David's like, I'm going to get this rid of this thing as fast as I can. And then it says that the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So as long as that was there, Obed-Edom was deemed blessed, and so was his house. Well, then word got back to King David that he was blessing the house of Obed-Edom. And so David's like, well, maybe it's time to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David, into the holy city of Jerusalem, into Zion. And so he brings it, and David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. And so David and the house of Israel were bringing the Ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of trumpet. You notice, when it says he was dancing, it wasn't he was just dancing. He was dancing with all his might. Craig, would you demonstrate how you dance with all your might? No. I mean, he was into it. He was dancing as if nobody else was watching, right? Dancing with all your might. It's interesting to see what the Bible records. And, and they want you to know that he was... I would say in a place of worship when he was dancing. By the way, I think that passage was one that was used in Footloose to say dancing's okay. Um, but anyway, that was a side note. So here it says that, so he's dancing into the city, and his wife, Michael, the daughter of Saul, she was looking out, she was up in her house, and she was looking down, and she was watching her husband going through the streets, half naked, dancing for the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. Do you know who also despised David in his heart? Her dad, Saul. You get the correlation there? And so they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And in verse 20, when David returned to bless his household, Michael, the daughter of Saul. Do you hear? She isn't the wife of King David. She's the daughter of Saul. 
that should be a red flag to us that something is coming. And so she says to David, Oh, how the king of Israel distinguished himself today. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servant maids and one of, and as one of the foolish ones who shamely uncovers himself. And so David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will celebrate before the Lord. You're not going to stop me. I don't care what you have to say, but I was ushering in the Ark of the Covenant that we captured, and I'm going to dance it all the way into Jerusalem. Right? He was saying, this is unacceptable. We are going to rejoice. And then the author records, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Kind of tacking that on, saying, if that's how you want to be, then this is what's going to happen. So now we enter chapter 7. If you write in your Bibles, maybe you want to put an asterisk next to chapter 7. Because I would say that chapter 7 is one of the most important chapters of the Bible. And especially of the Old Testament. You may say, why is it so important? Well, let's dig into it. So, the Lord had given David rest from every side, from all of his enemies. And then he tells uh, Nathan, who's a prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. But in the same night, the word of the Lord went to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? For I have not dwelled in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and even a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone with the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? He was basically saying, no, you don't need to build me a fancy house. You don't need to build me uh, something like you would live in. So here comes an important part. This is what the passage that I read earlier. How God had established covenants all throughout the Old Testament. God was demonstrating his love for his people through a language that people understood, covenant language, promises made between two people. This is a covenant grant. This is like a gift. Usually grants, or covenants I mean, usually covenants are, you do this and I'll do this. You, you do these things and God will bless you. But in this case, it was a gift to David. And listen to how he talks about giving David a house. The Hebrew word is Baal, and it could mean uh, a family house, like an actual dwelling, like his palace. It could mean God's temple, God's house, but it also could mean a household, everybody in it. Like you know, like the church can be described as the building, but we also know, more importantly, that the church is the people in it, right? And so here it is. Uh, he is talking about building David a house, a household, a dynasty. And so here Nathan is telling him what the, the uh, covenant would be. 
I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off your enemies from before you. I'll make you a great name like the other great men who are on the earth. I'll appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them and they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. Do you wonder why Israel is so protective of their land and their country? Most countries are, right? But we learn that Jerusalem is a holy city. It's, it's the city of Zion. It's the city of David. And by the way, if you trace this idea of a holy mountain, of this holy city, you will find it again as a new Jerusalem. In the book of Revelation, it is what God is saying heaven will be like. So if you wonder why Israel is, so, um, uh, they want to protect Jerusalem. And by the way, Christians and Jewish people, we love the city of Jerusalem. And that's why the Muslims come in and try to overtake it. And so this city is important. And the, the country is where they were appointed a place, and so they will defend it. And so they're living in their own place. Um, it says, I'll give you rest from your enemies. And the Lord also declares that the Lord will make a house for you. And when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up a descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I think about the movie The Sandlot, if any of you have ever seen it. Forever. It's that kind of forever. When they would have been reading this, when the ancient people would have been reading this, and they saw a throne forever. Every king would have wanted a throne forever. Even Saul said, hey, allow my throne to go on. Uh, don't kill off my people, David. When you become king, don't kill off my people. Instead, allow them to live. That was Saul's desire. But here, his throne will live forever. How? How does it live forever? We know that it lives forever forever through the reign of Jesus Christ. We know that the Messiah come out of the line of David, and if you go into the Gospels, they're very, it's important for them to connect Jesus to David. And so they do that to show that this covenant was upheld by God and established not necessarily a kingdom on earth, but a spiritual kingdom in heaven. And so then Nathan spoke that to David. And then David prayed a prayer, which it recorded that he would inquire of the Lord and would pray to the Lord a lot. And this particular uh, prayer actually has a piece of it in Psalm 89, 1 through 4, that David had written. But this prayer really reveals the heart of David. In verse 22, it says, For this reason you are great, O Lord, for there is none like you, and there is no God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And then uh, in verse 29, now therefore may it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before you. So that's David's story. You see why chapter 7 is so important. It establishes this idea that God is going to bless David with the line and ultimately Jesus coming out of it. So here's some lessons. Have you ever thought about why God didn't allow David to build the temple? One reason could have been that he was busy waging a holy war, that he was doing God's work out and saying, I don't want you, David, to be concerned with making me a house. Another possibility 
is that he was a warrior with lots of blood on his hands and it would have it just simply would have been inappropriate for him to build a holy place maybe next week we're going to learn how david was a imperfect king maybe god knew that that was coming <coughs> second thing that we can learn is the davidic covenant Here's what God promised him. He was going to make David's name great. Mission accomplished. We're talking about him 2,000 years later, or more than 2,000, I mean, thousands of years later, and he is considered um, Israel's greatest king. The second thing is, he was going to appoint a place for his people, Israel, Jerusalem. And so God did that. Give rest for your enemies, at least for a time's sake. Make a house, a bed, a household, a dynasty through Jesus Christ. And so raise up a descendant, a house, and establish the throne forever. Third, here's who David was. First, he was a man after God's own heart. That's a good place to be. Imagine people describing you at your funeral. That he was a man, she was a woman after God's own heart. That's a, quite a description for David. Also, he sought God's direction all through David's life. He inquired of the Lord. He asked of the Lord. He prayed. And so that's something we need to take stock of. Also, he celebrated God's work. He worshipped with everything he had. He danced through the streets. You think people looked at David and said, he's that excited about the Ark of the Covenant, that God's covenant or uh, um, Ark was coming through. That must be some God he's rejoicing. You know, sometimes we can either be the greatest advertisement for God or the worst advertisement for God based on our attitude. You know, how, how you describe about going to church. Well, I got to go to church. It's Sunday, right? Like, how do you talk about God to those around you? Are you excited about God? David was excited about what God was doing in his life and in the life of his people. We should be excited as well. And we need to learn to worship like David. Also, he focused on God's priority. This is, this is difficult. When, when we have a family to raise, when we have a job, we have things that we want to do on our own, we need to relax. We are conditioned to take our own initiative in life in everything. For us to pause like David did, David was getting ready to go into battle, and he paused and said, Lord, what is it that you want of me? Through my life, I've witnessed God close doors and open doors. Close doors and open doors. Some of those doors, it slams shut. But it's God's direction on my life. And if you're not paying attention, it's easy to get discouraged when something doesn't go your way. But pretty soon, another door opens up that was far better than what was beyond that door. We need to focus in, just like we do with the moon, and to see and to focus in on God's priority. Look and look around you and say, okay, God, 
Where are you at work? So often, you know, we, we start something we want to do and we say, hey, God, come on along with me. Bless what I'm about to do. Instead of saying, Lord, where are you at work? And allow me to join in is the more appropriate response. So focus on God's priority. So how now shall I live? First, God is pleased with those who seek his direction for their lives. So seek his direction. There was a time in my life where I used to do it a lot more, but if I had a major decision or I was praying about something, um, I would actually fast while I was trying to seek God's um, uh, direction. Second, God is pleased with those who worship and celebrate him and his works. You know, if you view worship as just this hour, you're missing out. You have the opportunity, especially with technology today, you can worship 24-7 if you want. In a traditional, in, in the way that you want to worship, by singing or listening to podcasts and, and preachers or um, the other thing that I like to point out with worship is that the ancient languages worship and work were used interchangeably. You would worship while you work. Your work became your worship. By doing the very best you could at what you were doing was giving praise to God. Third, God is pleased with those who seek and to know uh, how to focus on his priorities. Look to God and focus on where he's at work. Focus on the things that matter most to God. So, let me leave you with this. I relate it to when you go into a restaurant and you get a server. Imagine getting a server that, uh, that has a bad attitude. I, I think about, have you ever heard of the end of ethics? It's a chain kind of in big cities and it's a 60s diner and they purposely have an attitude like that's their shtick. And the waiters and waitresses kind of chuck your stuff down, say, sit here, you know. And um, it's, it's entertaining, but if you didn't know that's where, like, that was what they did, it would be troublesome. You walk into a restaurant, you want to be served. You don't want them to, to make commands to you, to maybe they misunderstand exactly who you are, right? Like... You're the customer. Instead, you want to hear, hey, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Can I show you where to sit? What, what do you, would you like something to drink while you wait? Uh, hey, how about if you try the filet mignon? It's just excellent. And I get a bigger tip. I mean, no, just go ahead and try it. Right? <laughs> like, you want these people to be kind to you and to show you this good attitude. Well, you see, God didn't create you and save you so that he could serve you. Right? Some places you should go into, and it's, it's almost as if you're an inconvenience and you're there to serve them. But God created you and saved you so that we could serve him. And he wants you to service him. So maybe our questions to him as a server, God, what can I do for you today? How can I please you today, God? God, this is the best seat in the house. You can have it today. God, you really need to know um, 
it's not about me, it's about you. God, I'm getting ready to go to bed, but I want you to know, thank you for all the blessings of the day. Right, you see the attitude change and how worship can creep into our natural lives so that we can be focusing on him in absolutely everything we do. And our attitudes are reflective of serving him with a joyful attitude. David served God and he constantly inquired of him. And ultimately God blessed him. You see, in the Old Testament, the covenants were, if you're obedient, God will bless you. And God's still in the blessing business. And so how are you going to serve him today? Well, we know chapter 7 it's so incredible. This is part of why I absolutely love reading the Old Testament. Is it's constantly pointing to the new. And God was saying, okay, David, I'm going to take you and your line. You've been so faithful, so good, that I'm going to make your kingdom last forever. And so out of that line came Jesus. I want to invite the band to come up. That Jesus came, and he was the Savior, the Messiah that was predicted in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, through the line of David. And God saying, I'm, I've got something even better coming. But he let David know that it was going to come from his throne and ultimately establish a kingdom that would last forever. You see, Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem, exists in heaven. And when you read the book of Revelation at the tail end, it talks about this new reality that we call heaven. And it's through Jesus Christ that someday we'll see heaven. God sent his one and only son to live a perfect life, to die at the hands of sinful men, so that our sins would die on that cross with him. And then when he rose again, he triumphed, he stood in victory over sin and death and Satan. And so it's in that victory that we stand today that makes us worship all the more. And we can be thankful. We can live in freedom from our sins. If you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, you want forgiveness for your sins, do it today. We're going to stand and sing our hymn of invitation. When we do that, you can come. If you need prayer for anything, you can come and let me pray with you. Let's stand and sing.
forgive our faults, forgive our failures, and our weaknesses, and restore us. Lord, let us be the best servants that we can be. Lord, I pray that we may focus on you, and to live our life worthy of the calling that you've set before us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus. Amen. Well, we have some announcements for you. Okay. Uh, first of all, there is a congregational meeting today, immediately following the service. Um, today is Flag Day. Now, like I said, you have to sure to get your flags up. Um, helping Hands at Noon on Friday. Saturday is a Deacon's Meeting at 8 a.m. Uh, 21st is Father's Day. BBS was canceled this year. We do remember that. Um, but there are some other things that are going to be coming up for the uh, 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 camp and, and such. So you can you know, remember to read your bulletin. For that, and I think Michelle's up here to talk about that. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. I had to get the kids corralled. So, um, we have been approved to have a sports camp and Bible camp this year, but in a different situation of um, what I'm really asking is it's all based on the help I get. Um, we are going to be having 10 children per helper. So right now, I can have 10 kids at camp because I'm the first helper. So what I'm asking is just be praying about it. Um, the uh, Victory Sports Camp, I'm not just doing it one time per day. I'm doing it three times per day. So there's a rotation. There's even an evening rotation to help with maybe getting more help. So just be praying about that. And also, Bible Camp really depends on Forest Lake and their situation. They are closed June and July but they're holding it and they're wanting to get things going also. So Sean and I are having communication with that and what regulations we'll have to follow on that. But right now, everything's kind of based on how much help I have. And so just be praying about it. One day will help, a few hours helps. I just need to know when you're gonna be here so I can have a rotation through. And also the children that come on Sunday, um, I've sent a text, please get registered, because we also have to register on a slow process. So um, I text the Sunday children that come. I'm going to be doing Wednesday this week as long as I have the helpers. So I can include other children as long as I continue to get helpers. So just pray, pray about that ministry and everything goes well. I understand if you have health conditions or don't feel comfortable helping, I understand fully with it because we just don't know about this virus and everything in the situation. But um, again, um, also I have sponsored child still going. I have 51 <coughs> children sponsored so far. But like I said, I probably won't need the 125 that we have. So if you feel that's the way you want to contribute, that's also. And thank you for all the ones that have um, sponsored a child for that ministry. Okay, thank you, Michelle. And also remember on the 12th of July, we're going to honor the graduates. So, we haven't forgotten yet. Okay, that's all I got. All right. And then the last thing I want to mention is we're doing the Bible reading marathon. All 99 counties in Iowa does this. And we have teamed up with Van Buren County just because we like Van Buren County. And, um, and they invited us. And so uh, the past few years, we have um, had people sign up to read the entire Bible. You just choose a book and collectively read, we read the entire Bible. And so you can sign up for a book of the Bible. Um, and the cool thing back there is that it tells you approximately how long it will take you to read that particular book. So for me, those times, I usually double it since I'm a slow reader. But anyway, it gives you an idea of how long it will take you to read each particular book. And so anyway, we encourage you to sign up. We want to get the whole Bible read by our church as well. So go ahead and sign up out there. All the sign-ups are out there. All right. Rich, you ready? Ready. All right, let's sing. Okay. 